everyone. Thanks again. Good morning, everyone. I see so many of you rolling in and joining us today for our very first session of the We in PD series. I'm going to give everyone just a minute. I see the numbers um, getting higher and higher. We are really, really excited to have you all join us here today. And that number just keeps getting up and up. That's very exciting. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, I am Chelsea Dooley. I am one of the care advisors here at NeuroChallenge Foundation for Parkinson's. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Today we have a very good session for you featuring Dr. Peter Lewitt. I have a couple of our wonderful care partners here with us who without them, this series would not be possible. I have Jackie Whitus and Kim Langenbach. I also have with me one of my coworkers and fellow care advisors, Ellen Schaller, who's going to be speaking at the end of the presentation a little bit about care advising. And then of course, our distinguished guest, Dr. Peter Lewitt. Again, I see some of you are still connecting, so I'm gonna give you just another minute here before I introduce our doctor. I'll go ahead and just tell you a little bit about NeuroChallenge briefly before turning it over. Um, we are in six different counties right now. We are, of course, via Zoom in more than that. We are all over Florida, in other states, even other countries. So we're very excited that via Zoom, we're able to reach people that are outside of our service area and provide this wonderful information. We are a nonprofit organization, meaning that all of our services are for free to the community. We have education programs like the program today. We have therapeutic programs. We have support groups and of course our care advising. So I see many of you are good to go and connected. Today's series will be recorded. So if there's anything in the series that you missed or you want to share with somebody um, who wasn't able to join us today, this will be posted on our website later. So again, welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Today, we have Dr. Peter Lewitt. Um, again, I'm Chelsea Dooley. I'm happy to welcome you all to today's series. This series is a little bit different than our normal series that you may have seen before in other webinars because it was designed and developed by NeuroChallenge caregivers. In total, 18 of them combined their thoughts and decided on some of the top issues that people might want to hear about who are caring for or have been recently diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. We have two of our wonderful care partners here from our community, Jackie Whitus and Kim Langenbach. And again, Ellen Schaller is also joining us from NeuroChallenge Foundation. Today, we have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Peter Lewitt. And I'm just going to do a quick screen share here. Today's presentation is working together to plan, prepare, and partner through a neurological disorder a doctor's prescription for the Parkinson's journey. Today's presentation is a conversation with Dr. Peter Lewitt, facilitated by our care partners, Jackie Whitus and Kim Langenbach. Today's program is made possible by the generosity of the sponsorship of Supernus Pharmaceuticals. And today we have Dr. Peter Lewitt again. He directs the Parkinson's Disease and Movement Disorders Program at Henry Ford Hospital in West Bloomingfield, Michigan. Dr. Lewitt has extensive experience in designing and conducting clinical trials for Parkinson's disease and other neurological disorders, and his research interests have included animal models and biomarkers of neurological disease, pharmacokinetic and pharmacodynamic analysis of neurological drugs, and gene therapy. He's also the author of more, more than 300 publications, including two books, which we are going to hear a lot about today. We are very, very excited to welcome Dr. Peter Lewitt. Thank you, Dr. Lewitt. And I'm going to turn it over now to Jackie, who's going to ask our first question of our distinguished guest. Thank you, Jackie, and thank you, Dr. Lewitt. 
Thank you. Nice to be here. Well, um, Kim and I are going to tell you a little bit about ourselves first, and then Kim's going to ask the first set of questions for Dr. Lewitt. Um, I'm Jackie Widus. I was a caregiver for my husband, Jeff, for 14 years before he passed away in 2019. Um, we were living in New Jersey when he was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And I remember so clearly when he said to the doctor, you know, I'm scared of this diagnosis, that the doctor turned to him and said, well, you know, old age is not for wimps. Jeff was not a wimp for his reaction to that diagnosis. And neither are you. The caregivers who helped put this program series together know and understand the life-changing impact of a Parkinson's diagnosis and the many, many worries that accompany it. How much better it would have been for us if that doctor could have said, I know this is a big shock, but here's some literature about an organization that can help you understand the disease, maximize your physical and emotional well being, put you in touch with resources that can help you, and introduce you to a lot of really wonderful people along the way. To, Neuro Challenge Foundation helped Jeff and me in all those ways. And today, Neuro Challenge is beginning the program series I wish we had when we began our journey. Kim? Thanks, Jackie. I'm Kim Langenbach, and I'm the caregiver to my husband, Cliff, of 35 years. In 1985, there was little known about early onset Parkinson's disease. So unfortunately, Cliff was misdiagnosed with having atypical multiple sclerosis. We'd only been married a couple of years when we received this devastating diagnosis. Yeah, um, and we found little comfort a few years later when he was correctly diagnosed. There were no words of wisdom, no referrals to PD specific organizations, um, no lifestyle recommendations. We just left the doctor's office with a, we'll see you in three months. So Cliff and I struggled over the years, both personally and as a couple uh, to try to educate ourselves while trying to minimize the effects of Parkinson's disease. Although we found NeuroChallenge much later in our journey, it has been a source of support and resources and lasting friendships. And because of my experience, that's why I'm so proud to participate in this program. And it's my sincere hope that the We in PD series prepares you both for the journey that's ahead. Today, we have the pleasure of talking to Dr. Peter LeWitt about his new book, Parkinson's Disease, The Guide for the Newly Diagnosed, Understanding the Disease, Managing Your Symptoms, and Navigating Treatment. It is my great pleasure to introduce him. In the introduction to your book, Dr. LeWitt, you acknowledge the gut punch um, that Parkinson's disease diagnosis gives. But right off the bat, you indicate that it is neither a prelude to imprisonment nor a path toward accelerated mortality. Instead, you maintain that health and lifestyle changes can put PD at bay for more than a prolonged period of time. Why do you characterize it that way? Well, first of all, it's nice to be speaking with all of you and I, I look forward to your feedback to me because this is how I've learned what I should be saying or what I haven't said but should do it the next time in writing this book and in practice for more than 25 years now. Um, it's hard to generalize about Parkinson's disease. Everyone newly diagnosed has a different story ahead of them, has a different identity as someone with Parkinson's. At its best, it's a nuisance. It's a tremor. It's slowness of movement. It interferes with events, it changes your self-image. And fortunately for many people with Parkinson's, that is all it is. It's feared for the disabilities it produces. And believe me, as, as you caregivers and I have seen, it can be extremely disabling. It can interfere with just about everything in your day, in your life, in your work, in your family. But it also can be a milder disorder. And one of the challenges for me to get into the field is that there's so much you can do to treat it with medications, 
now with surgery, with the promise of even uh, possibly intervening and slowing down whatever is destined to happen, and certainly with changes in lifestyle. And those who uh, take this as a death sentence have not got good advice. They may not have good support from their environment of friends and family. Um, and I think what you can do is start the war, get the troops out to help you make this battle work so that if you have physical disability, you're supported and still exercise and daily accommodations with ways to prepare your meals, to communicate better. All of these things um, are, are in your hands. And unfortunately, the medical profession sometimes drops the ball. Uh, we can make referrals to physical therapists, speech therapists, exercise therapists. We can encourage people to uh, spend the winter in lovely places like where you are so you can be active every day outdoors rather than up here in the frigid north where just staying warm is our challenge. Uh, but there, there are many things that you can do to make uh, Parkinson's happen. And, and I'm, I'm pretty sure from reading about NeuroChallenge, you folks have seized upon that opportunity and amplify that for your members. So um, what you've just described is what you call the realistic optimism. Uh, so it requires more than just an upbeat attitude or taking your pills on time. Uh, you're talking about a commitment to a healthy lifestyle, well-planned meals, structured exercise, surrounding yourself with like-minded people, uh, support groups. So it's a commitment to action. Yes, and, and, and I'll give you some concrete examples. For one thing, whenever, um, and I've heard this from Parkinson patients, if you're with friends and the friend turns to the healthy spouse as if the person with Parkinson's can't answer for themselves, that's a friend you might not wanna have. It's not a positive experience. It, it may be that they're a good friend from way back, but all of a sudden the dynamic has changed in social interaction. So the circle of people, relatives, friends who don't give this positive identity of the person with Parkinson's is still that person. They may be slow in talking, but you don't fill in their words and you don't talk to the, the nearby person who seems to be faster in their conversation. That's just one concrete example. Um, what else about well-planned meals? Well, the medications, levodopa and the active ingredient of cinnamon, of course, is absorbed from the stomach. You have to figure out how meals do or don't interfere with it and make that part of your life to get the best you can out of that medication. So many people are mistimed in their medication. It's such a simple thing to do. Uh, and then the other thing is not to overdo it with protein restriction. Um, if you read about it and it sounds like a good idea, well, it works for some people, but not everybody. So you, you experiment with yourself. You, you get your family to experiment with you and observe and give you feedback. You were great at four o'clock yesterday, and but you had a snack at uh, two o'clock. Well, so what? You can have that snack at two o'clock. So I, I think getting a, a lot of uh, feedback to communicating with your care team is an important way to make those observations work. A lot of people with Parkinson's have a lot of self-awareness, but they don't observe themselves objectively the way, let's say, a physician would, but they can. They can keep records. Uh, you can use the grand picture of a week at a time as a way to guide somebody to do better and to be positive in terms of exercise. Exercise made you look better yesterday, not you haven't done the exercise. You know, it's, it's three o'clock and you didn't, didn't get on that treadmill. The, the positive encouragement of, of being active, of uh, communicating more, I'd like to hear more about that that you were reading is the kind of opening phrase that, that I'd like to hear more of from Parkinson patients rather than Oh, so you watched a show. Well, uh, you should have been exercising. In other words, take the negative out of it, put the positive into it. I think you folks, though, at NeuroChallenge are well aware of this. I just try to put it in the book because I was envisioning that isolated family, the folks who travel three or four hours to see me and may not be able to see me uh, for another six or eight months. And I wanted to put into writing at least these insights that I feel that, that everybody should hear from a support group from an organization like you have, and, and I would hope from primary care physicians as well as the specialists like I am. Well, you know, sir, since it's the new year and everybody's making resolutions and um, having a difficult time come February sticking to those, the path of least resistance is so tempting. 
So what are the consequences, Dr. LeWitt, of kicking the can down the road uh, for a few months or even a few years? Are we talking politics or are we talking <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well, uh, first of all, I mean, one thing about Parkinson's is don't take it too much to heart in the sense that what's going on in your brain where nerve cells have been lost and the chemistry is altered and so on. I mean, that's the, the, the substrate of the disease. There's not much you can do. You can't will it away. You can't exercise it away. You can't eat it away with a more healthy diet. It's there. It's the reality. It's, uh, as someone said, it's not going to kill you, but it's, it's, it's going to certainly give you a headache, uh, metaphorically, that is. And so, um, you know, not to exercise, for example, to pick on one thing, won't make Parkinson's get worse. I, it, it really would be unfair to characterize the biology of Parkinson's as something that you've got to do something right or it's going to get worse in you. It's there anyways. But your health is not just Parkinson's. Your health, your body, your emotional well-being are guided by other things than this disease. It doesn't own you. And that's what I think uh, should be the message. Kicking the can down the road, uh, you know, denial of disease is not a bad mechanism for Parkinson's because many people can get away with it. And again, I don't want to generalize about Parkinson's, but as many as 80% of people with Parkinson's disease find this a disorder that hits them when they forget to take pills on time, or they are up on a ladder and unwisely uh, discovering their balance doesn't work at that moment, or discovering that they really have a cycle to their day and they shouldn't be socializing in the late afternoon because their voice goes downhill then when it's perfectly okay in the morning. So you've got to self-discover uh, what's going on, but th there isn't anything inevitably waiting for you that you can avoid uh, if that's what you mean by kicking the can down the road. Uh, denial that you have Parkinson's works if in fact you're that lucky person who has such a mild condition that you can mask it and even not bother to share it with people. And if, if uh, anyone out there has, has had that experience of thinking that you can get away with hiding the tremor and hiding the facial uh, immobility or the shorter gait, I'll just give this insight. Most people who know you, who love you, who are around you, sort of recognize something's wrong, and they can often be reassured that you know that you have a medical or neurological diagnosis and that you're taking care of it. It puts them at ease. So think of that for those who are disease deniers, that there may be a price to that. Well, I want to I want to touch on that briefly. I, I know you're a neurologist and not a psychologist, um, but if so, but if the person with PD um, wants to keep it a secret and the care partner feels the need for a support group or to discuss uh, their anxieties uh, with someone, what practical advice would you give so that everybody's uh, desires and needs are being respected? Yeah, well, that's, that's a challenging, uh situation and one that I haven't mastered, uh, I often encourage people to be open because as I uh, indicated, uh, the diagnosis is uh, that something is wrong, that something is different is usually evident to people in your circle, no matter tremor or slowness of movement or change in voice. Uh, oftentimes it's misinterpreted as depression when it's really subtle because the slowness of movement is in fact a feature of uh, people with mild depression. In fact, if, if you see a psychologist and have the Hamilton depression scale uh, uh, used for assessing your mood, you discover that a number of features that are typical Parkinson disease features show up and you get four or five points of on the Hamilton depression scale just because you have Parkinson's, whether or not you're depressed. So it's very important, I think, for uh, that discussion to occur that, it, that there's no stigma to having Parkinson's, that you don't have to hide it. Uh, I think the patient who knows that it's not hereditary in the vast majority of cases, will be more at ease talking to family members because there's a sense of guilt for the younger generation if you are in fact passing on a hereditary disease. Well, Parkinson's isn't one of them. And likewise, uh, some patients are very ashamed of the uh, impact of special accommodations that have to be made, the wheelchair planning if, if they're uh, reached uh, that level of disability or the fact that their medications are expensive and they're using up financial resources that were meant for retirement. Uh, any number of things like that. So maybe getting at the root of why you keep it a secret 
is a good discussion to have from time to time. And there's also the milestone notion that after some period of time, and I use it at, at three years, but it, it's really an arbitrary number, at some point, your destiny of whether you're gonna have mild and non-disabling Parkinson's starts to become a more and more clear story. And three years is a good landmark for that. And so by that time, uh, your view of sharing it with other family members, letting out the secret, letting out the, uh, the certainty of diagnosis that other people may have had a suspicion about, especially if there were tremor or something so obvious that you know, the common man could not miss that something neurological is going on. That's, that's certainly a time to rethink that strategy. That said, I have a patient now who's eight or nine years out and he still hasn't told his family or his sons, uh, who I'm sure know that he has Parkinson's and is doing very well. Great, Jackie. Good morning, Dr. Lewitt. Good morning. Um, I'm sure there are some people who are watching uh, this program who were initially diagnosed with Parkinsonism or even something else like Kim's husband was. Um, why is it sometimes difficult to get a clear-cut diagnosis? Well, there are very good reasons because there is no one test. Uh, the best uh, test for in medicine for uh, definitive action uh, answers is anemia. If you do a blood count and you don't have enough red blood cells, you're anemic. It's pretty obvious, cut and dried. Parkinson's different story. What we actually diagnose clinically, that is in the office and even with all the testing available, is Parkinsonism, the syndrome, the symptoms, the complaints, the typical findings on exam of Parkinson's disease, but not all Parkinsonism is Parkinson's disease. It can be 95% certain, but you never have 100% certainty. And those of us who are experts and looking for better diagnostic tools know that the gold standard right now is being about 90 to 95% certain, no better. It's important really to think of this as an evolving story over time, because the longer you go with Parkinsonism, the more likely it is Parkinson's disease. If you have a tremor at rest, it's more likely Parkinson's than not. If you respond well to a conventional dose of levodopa, the active ingredient of cinnamon, that adds to the evidence. So it's really like a, uh, a sharp lawyer stacking up the evidence and trying to talk to the jury as to it can't be that multiple system atrophy that you read about. It can't be that progressive supranuclear palsy that you read about because now the test of time and the other evidence that goes beyond that very first meeting, we're getting more and more certain. And at a practical level, you don't really have to know 100% certain. What you want is the best treatment for it. You want to look at other treatable conditions that mimic Parkinson's disease. And in many instances, uh, if you're interested in clinical trials, think of uh, ways that you might channel this uncertainty into perhaps wanting to participate in research. And um, can a DAT scan provide a, a more definitive diagnosis? Usually not, and it's marketed as a scan Basically, it looks at the brain uh, for the chemistry of what's going on, the deficiency of dopamine. Dopamine is that chemical that's missing in everybody with Parkinson's disease and for which levodopa or drugs that mimic its actions like premipexol or rupinerol, these drugs replace that and the DAT scan looks for that. But I wouldn't recommend a DAT scan in my professional opinion for most situations because it doesn't tell you anything different than what a trial of levodopa might tell you. And the other important thing is the disorders that mimic Parkinson's disease, and here I'm including progressive supraclitoral palsy or PSP or multiple system atrophy or a few others, they also have an abnormal DAT scan. So you don't get the proof that you have Parkinson's disease, you have a Parkinsonian disorder. Well, a good clinician knows that in the office, doesn't confuse your condition with essential tremor, which is what the DAT scan is marketed for. So I, I find it's much overused and usually unnecessary, and it shouldn't be um, as important uh, as some clinicians seem to think it is. There are other tests that can be done. One shouldn't have to do an EEG, a brainwave test for, for diagnosing Parkinson's, and even doing an imaging of the brain, a CAT scan or MRI, usually isn't necessary. And um, when, when would you suggest that someone get a second opinion? Well, when you're not satisfied, it's that simple. 
Um, there are a number of, of Parkinson disease specialists in this world. Neurologists are Parkinson's disease specialists, but they're those who've made it their life's work to be a subspecialist. A movement disorder uh, specialist is generally someone who has taken Parkinson's disease and other conditions that mimic it to a much higher level of study uh, in terms of their training. They may read journals uh, on that topic daily. There may be research going on in their clinics. There may be a much higher sense of the exotic aspects of Parkinson's, the, the problems that you don't see every day or every month. But not everybody necessarily needs a second opinion. On the other hand, if you're not getting satisfying answers, even from a very competent movement disorder specialist, time to move on. Uh, I've seen that for time and time again, that someone went to the, you know, I'm not gonna pick on the Mayo Clinic or the Cleveland Clinic or this clinic or that, but, but sometimes even the most distinguished of places that are academically oriented don't have the level of information. The, the clinician has time to speak to you and answer every question or is willing to pick up the phone or the email as you come in with some feedback. That's the time for a second opinion, not because the expertise is in question, but because your skills, uh, your, the skills that are displayed are not syncing with your needs. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, some people talk about the stages of Parkinson's disease, um, but you don't take this approach. You prefer to talk about uh, PD in your book uh, about potential outcomes. Why don't you like stages and what do you mean by outcomes? Well, the thing about stages, and, and here we're referring to the HONE and YAR stage, H-O-E-H-N and YAR. This was published in the 1960s and even uh, HONE and YAR, I got to know them personally, um, never were interested in that. That came from an era before effective medications were developed and people uh, if they progressed with Parkinson's disease, got worse in various ways. They had balance impairment uh, or other, even the tremors, the, the very first symptoms would not be well uh, controlled because the medications weren't there. That's totally different now. So someone can have 20 years of Parkinson's disease and if they're fortunate, fully responsive to medication. In other words, it's only if you took away their medication that you could put them into Honanyar's description. It's really an inadequate way of describing the disorder. And really what the modern patient is experiencing is some people have good control of symptoms consistently, others have fluctuations. Some have balance problems, others don't. Some have involuntary movements or dyskinesias, others don't. Some people have uh, a lot of side effects like hallucinations or sedation for medicines, others don't. Some have low blood pressure. In other words, as I go through this, this catalog, uh, those are the disabilities, those are the outcomes, those are the unmet needs of that person. And so that's their stage. They have these problems, they get up and they feel lightheaded. They have falling problems, they have dexterity problems, but it's, it's hard to say that's stage three or stage two, that, that kind of staging isn't there. We have rating scales, the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, and we can add up a list of all these symptoms and we can characterize somebody very nicely by this catalog, but even that is really just the story of what somebody tells their doctor. I have tremors, I don't like them. I want them to go away, those cramps in my feet at night. Uh, let's, let's deal with that. So being problem oriented, I think, is the way to view the stage, uh, that concept. Mm -hmm. um, I, have, I hate to get into this topic of the internet and the supposed cures and re or disease reversing treatments, but it's out there. And I know that people look at those. So can you set the record straight for us on these claims? Well, the internet has authoritative information. And for example, the Michael J. Fox Foundation, the Parkinson's Foundation, uh, Cure PD Trust in England. I have a number of these listed in, in, at the end of the book, but uh, there are authoritative sources. And then some of us, myself included, are involved in clinical trials and we offer to our patients or those interested in participating studies that clearly don't say we have the cure for you. We are doing a study trying to slow down disease, we might say in our informed consent. And there are trials, there are very promising ideas out there. There've been almost 30 large scale clinical trials over more than 30 years that have been intended to find the cure, to find something that could slow down disease. But there are a number of challenges ahead. We don't know what causes Parkinson's or if there are multiple causes. There certainly are genetic and non-genetic causes that are very 
intriguing in terms of suggesting what we might do for a trial. And we're currently doing studies with the hopes that we've hit it this time or will next time. But uh, a lot of the things that are out there, glutathione injections is, is a notorious uh, issue in Florida because of a certain clinic there. I'm not going to name it, but uh, many have seen the advertising, the books that promote it. It absolutely is not a cure. It's a big lie. We're dealing with a lot of science uh, misinformation, unfortunately, on the internet, not to mention word of mouth. And you just have to assume that if there was a cure, those like myself who are Parkinson specialists would be offering every day, we'd be taking it ourselves. Um, if a certain vitamin, if a certain food, if uh, staying away from that carbohydrate or what, you know, all the th crazy things that I've heard, they sound so plausible to a non scientific uh, person because, you know, science uh, has a certain uh, burnish on it of, uh, it must be true because someone is saying it on the internet or has even written a paper about it. But science is constantly evolving. A lot of things, if you pick up a neurology textbook from 25 years ago, it almost is laughably incorrect. Uh, doctors should be throwing out their books even at 10 years in many cases because of the misinformation or the new evolution. Science is a method and it, it uh, restores information. So if you read a paper from 1990s that uh, selegiline or deprinol is disease modifying, you'll find a retraction of that two years later that it didn't do that, for example. Mm -hmm. So I hope I've, I've answered that question, but keep in mind that there are sources of authority even on the internet. So there is good no news though. You write in your book that there is some evidence that endurance training and certain types of exercise may exert an influence on the PD brain that could slow the rate of disease progression. We're gonna have a, a program on that next week with Dr. Ellis from Boston University. But uh, for those who can't make it next week, can you just briefly talk about that? Well, Dr. Ellis is, is just the right person to be talking about that. And there are other investigators uh, also around the US at uh, the University of Southern California, one of my colleagues there. There's, there's a lot of evidence and actually in animal studies where you can model Parkinson's disease, there are clues uh, that um, uh, exercise, uh, if you think a rat running on a treadmill is, is exercise, well, that is. Um, all of these things seem to have a positive effect. And of course, increasing your endurance, increasing your overall mobility or ability to catch yourself against falls or well, think of it, a, a, a somebody who doesn't play the piano and, and a year later has taken lessons and played scales, they can do things with their fingers that they couldn't do before. It, it just is intuitive that any kind of exercise and training will have an impact on your functioning better. And physical therapists and occupational therapists and exercise therapists see this in individual patients. It's hard to quantify it to what any one person is going to get from it, but you know, just thinking of the fact that this is, this is your opportunity, do it, and uh, you may enjoy it as well. Exercise shouldn't be a chore. Kim? Thanks, Jackie. Dr. Um, Lewitt, you have an entire chapter in your book uh, about treating PD, uh, which gives readers um, a view of the available therapies. But for the purpose of this discussion, we'd like to just touch on um, three things. Not long ago, some physicians postponed uh, prescribing carbidopa levodopa uh, until a later phase of PD. Uh, yet now it's the drug of choice and it is prescribed um, almost immediately after diagnosis. Uh, how did that change in philosophy come about? Well, levodopa has been on the scene since 1967. It's the most logical therapy. It's, it's nature's way of making dopamine in the brain. And uh, it never really was controversial that you should hold off. This, this was an attitude, and indeed you're using the term philosophy uh, as, a, as a cover for the term uh, patronizing opinion that some physicians uh, imposed. In other words, they saw the physician, and I'm, I'm not, it's not me, because I never was of that mindset, but there is a notion that levodopa might have a limited duration of action or that it has toxicity to it, has side effects, so that you should stay away from it and you know, forget about those tremors or that slowness of movement until you're really falling down or, or you just can't do things with your hands. Pretty patronizing because the patient 
with the mild symptoms doesn't want to have those symptoms. They want to fit into society. They want to have the opportunity to entirely mask this disorder to, to join the normal again. And there isn't any scientific evidence. In fact, some very important and influential studies over the years have absolutely proven that starting the drug from day one, when the symptoms are diagnosed, there's no reason on medical grounds not to do that. Levodopa never stops working for you. It's the most effective therapy. And moreover, it's the most cost-effective therapy so that people who are started on expensive drugs like resagiline or dopaminergic agonists are not only taking medications that are less effective than levodopa, they're paying more money for them and they may have more side effects. So the evidence is very strong and actually one of the standards by which you might judge a treatment, if I can offer this opinion, is a neurologist or a physician who doesn't have that point of view is not up to date with modern thinking. And modern thinking is scientifically guided, not just an opinion. Holding off in medication, of course, is a patient's judgment. There, this isn't a cure, it's a symptomatic therapy. And if you feel you don't need any of these medicines, um, that's your right. And, and indeed, uh, I only encourage people to try them to know what they're missing if their mindset is not to take advice from a pill pusher like me. But the majority of people with Parkinson's do well on levodopa or other medications. We have tremor drugs that are different than it. And uh, there's no medical reason at this time, and there really wasn't even 20 or 30 years ago to stay away from levodopa. Thank you for clearing that up. Most of our audience um, know about the motor symptoms of Parkinson's, tremor, uh, unsteady on your feet. Uh, but over the last decade or so, there's been an increase uh, awareness in the medical community about non-motor symptoms. And there are a whole host of those. Uh, but chief among them is anxiety and depression. And many people will seek treatment for Parkinson's disease, but the stigma associated with seeking treatment for uh, anxiety, depression, et cetera, uh, prevents people from seeking help. What, what would you say to people who feel that way? Well, uh, indeed, attention to the non-motor features of Parkinson's is, is very important because these can add to the disabilities and the social isolation. And they aren't as simple as just putting dopamine to work the way that the motor symptoms uh, are so well relieved in most people. All I can say is this, this is a problem of not just people with Parkinson's. There is a denial factor of being depressed or that anxiety rules your life or keeps you away from social interactions. <clears throat> this is where uh, turning to someone who is a good source of advice in terms of trying out such therapies, uh, uh, doing a catalog of how your lifestyle reflects the fact that diagnosis of uh, depression isn't just a hunch, but clearly shown in, in actions. Um, fortunately, the medications uh, that treat both of these conditions are very safe. They're easy to use once a day in most instances or used for a few hours at a time. Usually uh, the treatments for anxiety are fairly fast in terms of their actions and you can get a very good idea that they agree with you and that they're working. Antidepressant drugs often take a commitment of four to six weeks of being on that drug to gradually see the trend for improvement. And antidepressant drugs can also improve anxiety. So you get two for the price of one. But all I can say is uh, besides the positive experiences of a lifestyle that includes exercise and increasing your socialization and self-awareness that in fact your social withdrawal may be a symptom of depression or anxiety. Uh, all of these things fit together with the notion that there are competent people who can talk to you about how to deal with these things. It isn't all about pills, but the medications also have a huge impact and people with Parkinson's disease are much more likely to have depression on a biochemical basis than those without. And even though you're a movement disorder specialist, in your book, you maintain that not everyone needs a movement disorder physician. Why not? And who are the medical personnel that a person who's been diagnosed with PD should surround themselves with? Well, I want to emphasize that neurologists are trained and are specialists in Parkinson's disease. And many general neurologists who haven't spent the extra years. I spent three years as a 
uh, movement disorder uh, specialty trainee, but the average neurologist gets that training uh, within the boundaries of their three-year training in general neurology. Um, as someone develops further problems of Parkinson's disease, for example, if the condition uh, is not adequately controlled with medications uh, and consideration of deep brain stimulation, for example, to treat tremor or dyskinesias, or if someone wants to participate in the clinical trial, or at the onset, uh, there wasn't great certainty that Parkinson's disease was the answer because maybe strokes had occurred and maybe something else was going on to cloud the issue. That's where a movement disorder specialist or just a second opinion by someone who specializes in Parkinson's, whether or not they advertise themselves as a movement disorder specialist, uh, that second opinion can be valuable for reassurance and education. By the way, there's, there's a certain number of people who specialize in their clinical practice for Parkinson's disease, but don't specialize for the many other movement disorders, which include dystonia, other kinds of tremor, Tourette syndrome, gait disorders, and so on. So not every Parkinson specialist is necessarily a movement disorder specialist. On the other hand, there's an increasing number of movement disorder trainees every year. Uh, major medical centers always seem to have uh, a group uh, at our, our institution here at Henry Ford and at Wayne State, we have several in our departments. And uh, this is sort of, uh, well, you know, the, the, the tendency in, in, in modern medicine to seek out people who have a little bit more expertise than the generalist. Thank you very much, sir. Before Jackie. we go to our last section with Jackie, I do quickly want to remind people that there is a Q&A at the bottom of your screen. So when we have um, when we have a conclusion of our questions from our care partners, if anyone has a question for Dr. LeWitt, you can put that in the Q&A section. Thank you. Um, Dr. LeWitt, um, we know that a senior citizen who is a caregiver um, has a 63% higher mortality rate than someone the same age who is not a caregiver. And that's for every disease, not just Parkinson's. Um, so we advocate a team approach that acknowledges the need to care for each other at every step of the way. And that's what we call putting the we in PD. And interestingly enough, you talk about the concept of we in your book and how it can have positive uh, therapeutic effects, but it's a little bit different than what I just described. So can you tell us your observations about this? Well, I'm so sorry to hear that uh, you increase your mortality by that fraction. I, I think the positive experience of being a caregiver sometimes outweighs perhaps uh, navigating life's risks of your health. And indeed, a lot of people with, who are caregivers uh, who have had to do a little bit of lifting, heavy lifting, literally uh, have back problems or have gone down with a fall sometimes uh, taking uh, gravity's effects. Uh, all I can say is that, you know, it, it's a, a, a Parkinson's a disease that has uh, so much to gain from family support. And one of the challenges is sometimes as individuals get older that the caregiver falls entirely on the spouse and the younger generation or friends who are healthy in that age range don't feel welcome to join in or, or they don't get the signals that they should be helping out. Uh, uh, in addition, I think a lot of caregivers don't realize that there are other resources out there, including respite care sometimes are local uh, Parkinson organizations have people who are very happy to come, uh, even being total strangers to start with, and all of a sudden you have a new care partner in, in your uh, community. Uh, all I can say is that this it, it's a great movement that's happened. And a lot of the um, support group movement grew up in the 1960s around Parkinson's disease before many other uh, disorders like arthritis and, and other health conditions where the group, the family, the support system makes such a big difference. Uh, down here in Florida, we have a lot of what we call snowbirds, people who live part of the year up north and part of the year down here. And um, sometimes they have uh, doctors up there and doctors down here. And we know that since the pandemic uh, began, that there's been a growth in doctor visits via Zoom. I'm wondering if going forward, this is gonna revolutionize the way uh, we visit doctors and because, um, and, and that it may um, simplify the network of doctors for people who have Parkinson's. What do you think about that? 
Well, I think it already has revolutionized that. Uh, there's some limitations to it uh, in, in the first few months of the pandemic where we couldn't see people live. Uh, we started doing it, but we also uh, were warned by our hospital administration, I'm an employed physician, that you know they, the billing for this had certain rules and you know, and, and obviously we would discourage uh, a Zoom visit or a remote visit if, if we could bring that person in live without risk to them, of course. Uh, that's changing. And I, I think we're recognizing, especially for repeat Parkinson's care, that there's a very sac satisfactory visit that can occur by video uh, and even by telephone for those who don't have that capability. Uh, it's not the same thing. Uh, we do have to see people uh, in the flesh, as it were, to diagnose certain conditions that you can't do any other way. Certainly other aspects of medical care, like those with cardiac problems, have to be seen in person. But Parkinson's care, uh, the fact that you can uh, spend a little less time on a visit that is highly satisfactory and not burden the patient with transportation in and dealing with snow like is coming down out my window here uh, in, in Detroit, uh, indicates that, that we're going to do better. And by the way, remote care medicine has been the norm in, in uh, the northern parts of Canada and Alaska and in places around the world where physicians are few and far, and yet the advice, whether it comes out of a telephone or a, a video camera or in person, is the same advice in many instances. So I have just one more question before we turn it open uh, to the audience. Uh, your final message in the book is that people who take action early to manage their PD will have will likely have no significant disabilities five years later and potentially longer. And you write for your, as your prescription, find others who will work with you to make this happen and surround yourself with them. Can't fill that prescription at Walgreens though, can you? Well, depending uh, if you have some friends at Walgreens, why not? No, I, I what, in other words, uh, one of the challenges is change your social milieu by which I meant you know, find the positive people in your life, people who talk to you when you're there with your spouse, let's say, and not to the spouse and say, what does she think? Or, and even if communication is difficult, find, you know, better ways to communicate, get that, uh, that tablet out and start writing when, when your voice is trailed off. If you're that uh, occasional person with Parkinson's who can't speak loudly and clearly, get an amplifying system, Get a tablet where you can write things out where words, you know, if, it, where your medicine is worn off and all of a sudden you want to keep, keep that conversation going or put up your hand and say, give me a minute uh, or let's go for a walk. And, you know, we'll have, instead of continuing this conversation on the couch, we'll just go outside and we'll look around and, and I'll be able to put a few words into it. In other words, get some confidence that people accept your Parkinsonism and the capriciousness of moment to moment changes that you can handle that, that it's still part of a social uh, environment and, and uh, you can have fun. Or uh, if, if you can play games uh, like, uh, you know, badminton or something like that, go out and make, make games more part of your social events rather than the stresses of doing communication, which, which often is the most difficult thing to do when, when this medication isn't working well. And for all uh, patients out there, the message is there's, there's a very good chance that your medications can be better adjusted to control what's going on. Levodopa is a short acting drug and some people are on four or five hour uh, dosing cycles and uh, get at your physician, complain a lot. That's another part of your milieu or complain with the nurse practitioner and say, is there something I can try on my own to see if I can do better? That's another part of your social group push those caregivers who you're paying good money to, to, to do something for you when you're not doing well. Thank you, Dr. Lewitt. It's been a pleasure talking with you and we very much appreciate your participation. Thank you, well, sir. Thanks. Yes, thank you for that wonderful information. And we do have uh, several questions that have popped up from our audience. Um, the first one is in reference to adult children. We talk a lot about care partners Oftentimes that is a spouse, but there are many that are adult children as well. Um, also children who may or may not live in the same state or area as their parent. How do you recommend that children become involved of the care of a family member with Parkinson's? Well, several ways. First of all, I think uh, if, if you have 
group meeting, support group, that they should become involved. They should be empowered to feel that they're part of that discussion, to learn from caregivers so that they can get some courage up to be that. After all, remember, they were parented years ago, and now they're taking on a parenting-like role. And I've, I've heard that, 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 that there's been a reluctance because they they don't know when to intrude in their parents' life, that there's you know the sense that that, that somehow this is socially distressing to the parent and, and you want to abolish that. Number two, if they live, live far away and they're of sufficient means, they should make a financial offer. There are always uh, care facilities that offer respite care. If there's a spouse who has become the round the clock, the 36 hour caregiver uh, that uh, get the younger generation to start chipping in for that $20 an hour or sometimes more respite care and blocks of four hours so that the I mean, that, that's the perfect gift for some the spouse with Parkinson's who's uh, functioning sometimes as, a, as you know, the in-house nursing service. Uh, you know, make that a regular gift or come visit and, you know, with the intention that the spouse can go off and take a vacation with their friends. I mean, th these are just some of the ideas there, but th there is need to break the ice. And in fact, I think that's what physicians should be doing, you know, asking that question in the workup, not how are you feeling, but how's the rest of your family interacting with you? And, and if, if they're not, why not? What's going on that keeps them? What myths do they have that make them think they shouldn't be visiting frequently with grandchildren or putting the grandchildren on the line and explaining to those kids about Parkinson's and why grandpa has, you know, that uh, tremor in his hand, give them some of those books that are written for kids with Parkinson's so that they will write a school report on Parkinson's and they will you know, look forward to learning more about it because who knows, they someday might have it themselves. We're all at risk, right? Thank you. Um, the next question is, is there any information that patients should track and bring to their appointment when they see their neurologist? Yes, I think uh, you know the home diaries that you can get off the internet, uh, hour by hour uh, pattern analysis of how medications work, especially if you're having motor fluctuations, if you're having tremors at different times of the day, if dyskinesias are happening, uh, you don't wanna just estimate, you wanna actually have hard evidence. And so what we do in clinical research sometimes is give a diary where a patient describes himself as on, that is moving well, medicine's working great, or off, some symptoms have emerged. And patients can do this every half hour for an entire day. It doesn't kill you. You can even set this up on your phone or a tablet. And keeping records like that, especially when you're on a levodopa regimen that isn't optimal, and you get a few days of evidence that three hours later, your medicine is wearing down. That's very useful information. We ask those questions of patients in our office but if you actually have the hard evidence or that you're having involuntary movements, even if the doctor doesn't see it, that doctor will believe you if you've, you've charted it. The second thing is, is if you do have MRI pictures of brain from some other uh, practitioner or CAT scan, get those, keep those in your possession. They're sometimes hard to get. Otherwise, they all fit on discs these days. And it's worth having those on hand, especially if you ever fall, hit your head. Someone will want to look at the previous scan for comparison purposes. Great, thank you. Can you discuss a little bit the impact of cognitive decline on both the person with Parkinson's and the person caring for them? Hmm, how many hours do we have? <laughs> uh, for one thing, first of all, not everybody with Parkinson's disease has cognitive decline. Unfortunately, it is, as, as you're aware in asking that question, a little bit more common. And as people get older, there are other diseases even more daunting, such as Alzheimer's disease. And uh, sort of the general thing that happens when, when you get really old where hearing and vision uh, sort of escape you and perhaps your social isolation has deprived you of a little bit of that interactiveness with culture and news and orientation. But there is a real disease of the brain that is, is linked to Parkinson's disease. It has medications that are really imperfect in helping. There's a lot of research at clinical trials in, in our center. We're gonna be starting a clinical trial very soon with a cognitive enhancing kind of therapy. Uh, it's important to remember that depression confounds cognitive decline. People who are very depressed uh, often appear to be uh, cognitively declining or demented. 
Uh, and in fact, the severe depression uh, makes it hard to figure that out. So that sometimes uh, the proper approach is to assume that you cannot diagnose it. It's a diagnosis of suspicion and a diagnosis of exclusion. There are tests, however, available, uh, scans of the brain, uh, neuropsychological tests that can confirm uh, at least the, the conditions of, of significant impairment. Driving, independent function, taking care of financial affairs, very important to screen for capabilities and competence because too often these problems are discovered when something bad has happened, when people have been financially uh, 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 taken advantage of or an automobile accident occurs for someone who just doesn't have the cognitive capabilities, if not the physical abilities. So it's a very important issue. I, I hope your uh, seminars will will touch on that. And, and there's certainly people who have, uh, are very knowledgeable about this. As a neurologist, you also have to be quite aware of it because uh, this is part of the picture of people who are aging and who happen to have Parkinson's. Great, thank you. There are a couple of questions in reference to um, the protein absorption. I know you spoke a little bit about that earlier, um, but can you go a little bit more in depth as to whether somebody does need to be concerned about the timing of their medication, meal planning around a certain schedule and the difference between animal versus plant protein? Yeah, great deal has been made about this. There's a lot out there. There's probably too much because it's actually a, a relatively small problem in the general population of people with Parkinson's. So let me state that the main thing that interferes with the regularity, regularity of absorption of levodopa and other medicines is food in your stomach. The stomach is a digesting organ and medicine is not absorbed in your stomach. It's absorbed downstream. It has to get out of the stomach. If you're digesting a meal, that takes about 30 to 45 minutes. No traffic passes through the stomach at that time. Your medicine doesn't get absorbed. So it makes sense to take your medication before or after a meal, half hour before, an hour afterwards. If you can, it, it isn't that you can't eat a meal and take the medicine, it's just the chance of that drug absorbing at the pace and at the magnitude that you want it to do might be interfered with. But anyone can do that experiment. There are a lot of people taking pills with meals. These levodopa comes from the pharmacy saying, take with food. And if you do that and it find it works perfectly well, end of story. Now the protein story, uh, levodopa, the active ingredient of cinnamon is an amino acid. Protein, whether it's animal or, or uh, uh, vegetable uh, derived, all turns into amino acids. It's digested from being proteins and broken down to amino acids. That amino acid load that comes from a meal can, and I emphasize can, not necessarily does, compete with the uptake of levodopa. There's about 18 inches in your small intestine where most of the amino acids gets absorbed. And if you simultaneously have a 12 ounce steaks derived amino acids from the protein and steak, you may have less absorption of the drugs amino acid, the levodopa. So it's very possible to do your own experiment and you can answer this question. If you have lunch for two or three days in a row and you have a high protein lunch, fish, an omelet, yogurt, something that has a lot of protein for the purposes of testing that out. And then just see how your afternoon goes. Do you have as much tremor or more tremor? Do you find yourself more slowly moving? If so, you interfered with the uptake because of that high protein intake and your uh, ideal functioning might be served by not having as much protein. You don't have to completely abolish it, but certainly don't overdo it. And then if you do a low protein lunch for a few days ago, a few days in a row, salad, fruit, something like that, and you basically function the same way in the afternoon as when you took the high protein, you don't have to think about it. And I can tell you after many, many people who've tried that experiment, the protein content of meals, whether at lunch or breakfast or throughout the day, uh, generally doesn't have much of an effect. It's overstated. It's just one more complication in your life that you don't have to deal with, but you can answer the question yourself. You don't have to read about low protein diets and so on. If you are very sensitive to protein intake, then the recommendation is get most of your daily protein in the evening meal uh, or even close to bedtime. And of course you can't live without protein. So there's nothing to be gained by eating a low protein diet uh, or low amino acid content diet or changing from animal to, to vegetable protein and amino acids and amino acid. 
So that's that's a basic story. And there really isn't much new research on this topic. A lot of it is is very old, going back to the 1980s, 1990s. Fantastic, thank you. Um, can you speak about any treatment options for those dealing with lightheadedness? Yes, lightheadedness, if it's due to low blood pressure and there are other causes for lightheadedness, should be evaluated by a three minute standing test. Does your blood pressure drop significantly from sitting to standing is the question to be asked. You can do it at home, of course, with your own equipment and write down the numbers. The healthy value should be no more than 15 points on the top number of the systolic. Everybody drops because of the effect of gravity. But if you go from sitting where you're not lightheaded to standing where you are lightheaded and you have a measurement that is more than 15 points, you have a condition that has a medical term called orthostatic hypotension, which just means upright orthostatic hypotension, low blood pressure. And there are treatments for that. One of them is to drink more fluids, whether water, tea, you name it. And the second is to increase your salt intake if medically indicated, if you don't have congestive heart failure or leg swelling or any other reason not to increase your salt intake. That's the first line treatment. There are other medications that are readily available. Physicians uh, know how to evaluate for this. There are a number of conditions that, that uh, can cause low blood pressure, but Parkinson's disease is one of the most common and some of our medications for Parkinson's uh, also as side effects, lower blood pressure. So getting, uh, getting these numbers, this is an example of something you can do at home before the doctor's visit so that you can say, well, I do have a significant blood pressure drop or I don't. And then the lightheadedness can be evaluated in different ways based on the hard evidence that you can bring to the examination. Great, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions relating to any connection between Parkinson's and, and another diagnosis, one of which is diabetes and another question references inflammation. I know those are two different things, but is there any connection between either of those two and Parkinson's disease? There are some connections. Uh, diabetes seems to increase your risk for uh, Parkinson's disease, although you know most people with diabetes don't get it and most people who have Parkinson's disease don't have diabetes, but when you look at large populations, you get some interesting associations pop up. Current research looking at neuroprotective therapies are looking at drugs like exenatide that are used to treat diabetes and also independently uh, may be useful as neuroprotective agents. They're not proven to work and they, it may be a coincidence that the drugs have two uh, potential uses, but, but there are some connections there. Uh, inflammation in the brain, there's a lot of evidence for inflammatory mechanisms. Um, some of the, the therapeutics uh, that are being investigated and not proven have anti-inflammatory uh, themes. At this point though, I would not look upon taking anti-inflammatory drugs for arthritis or diets that are claimed to have anti-inflammatory effects uh, or curcumin or other things like that. There's no evidence that these lower your risk for Parkinson's except uh, to, to what large population studies have shown as sort of a population effect. And um, that information has to be honed down to uh, what is the practical message for people and how can research really get to an answer. Suffice it to say, we don't know what causes Parkinson's or whether there are multiple causes, whether it's a cumulative effect. There's a lot of evidence of what goes on in our GI tract. The bacteria may be a factor. There's evidence that certain exposures may be a factor. And yet, remember, in 1817, when James Parkinson described it, it wasn't a modern time. There was no plastic around. There was no petroleum being used. And yet the same condition that we face today. Fantastic, thank you. Um, someone's asking if you have any real life tips and tricks on those challenged by the amount of medications and the amount of times per day um, that the medications have to be taken. Well, the trick is uh, to assess your response pattern. Many patients are served with, with immediate release leave it open by taking more than three times per day. Certainly there's no rationale to take it at bedtime. And beyond that, uh, you should uh, have that dialogue with your physician to what is the best dosing schedule? Um, can I take more? There's no reason not to take more than three or four or five leave it open per day if it works for you. It's a very safe medication and actually it's normally there in your diet anyways. And some form. Uh, the other drugs that are combined with levodopa, especially those for tremor, are perfectly healthy to take. Many patients will find their best 
level of control of Parkinson's taking three and sometimes even four medications together just because each one has a role to play. So it's, it's a disease where polypharmacy or multiple approaches can pay off, especially if you're having irregularity or uh, uh, at times of day when, when things aren't doing well. There are a couple of rescue therapies, uh, inhaled levodopa, uh, injectable levodopa, uh, apomorphine, apomorphine under the tongue that can deal with on-demand needs. And so a number of therapeutic advances have come around just in recent years that you should avail yourself if you have these problems. Keep complaining, keep uh, coming up with your problems so that you can get the attention during your visit. Otherwise your physician will write prescriptions and send you off for another six months or a year uh, without problems solved. Thank you. Any suggestions for people who have multiple conditions on how to best coordinate their care between different specialists for different conditions? Not really, I'm, I'm in a healthcare system where all those records end up electronically online. If you have something like my chart where you can have your records accessible in one healthcare system and you go to another doctor's office, you can always bring up your records on the spot there or you can print them out so that that they can be shared. Great, thank you. Um, does caffeine have any effect on Parkinson's disease? Well, uh, a habit of caffeine over a lifetime lowers your risk somewhat for getting Parkinson's. There's no reason to stay away from it. It doesn't increase tremor, even though the myth is that it should be stayed away from if you have tremors. Uh, uh, and uh, nothing wrong with it. I have a cup right here, in fact. Fantastic, thank you. Um, someone wants to know about loss of sense of smell and if that has anything to do with cognitive decline. Well, about one third of people with Parkinson's have impaired or absent sense of smell even years before the onset of Parkinson's. And, and there's a part of the brain that uh, is affected fairly early um, in, in the course of Parkinson's. That said, we don't know how to link that to uh, the mechanism disease. Uh, it's a dopaminergic territory where dopamine is, is a neurotransmitter, a signaling chemical. Uh, but I don't think it, it predisposes cognitive impairment uh, any more than having Parkinson's does. So I don't think there's a connection there. Great, thank you. These are some great questions, you guys. Um, someone would like to know if you can explain a little bit more the connection between Parkinson's and anesthesia, both exposure to anesthesia prior to diagnosis and also um, how one needs to be a bit careful about anesthesia once diagnosed? Well, it's, it's fairly common for an exacerbation of symptoms after an operation. And is it because of the, that anesthesia was used or medications were held for a day before or the, the pain uh, management with opiate drugs brings out hallucinations and confusional states as well as of uh, interfering with, with the effects of the levodopa. So it's a complicated issue, but suffice it to say that it is common that, um, that there will be a worsening or, or inadequate control, not to mention the fact that in the post-operative state or in hospitals in general, medications aren't given in time. Sometimes different dosage regimens than was previously used are uh, end up on the chart for uh, in, a, in a frustrating situation that is almost universal, including at my hospital. And, and finally, uh, the notion that sometimes the stress of anesthesia and so on brings out for the first time recognition in a medical setting that there's a tremor there, that there's something that catches the eye of a physician where the diagnosis is actually made immediately in that setting where, whereas it wasn't before. And yet it, it's hard to imagine that the stress of whatever led to an operation or the need for anesthesia was the cause. And, and there is no evidence that having had general anesthesia uh, repeatedly or extensively for you know, long operations causes Parkinson's, but um, the medical setting can bring out the, the problems of it for, for various reasons. Thank you. What can someone um, do to help the sleepiness caused by both Parkinson's and potentially some of the medications used to treat Parkinson's? Well, one thing is, is to evaluate for whether sleep uh, at nighttime is deprived. Uh, there are other conditions like sleep apnea, disruptions of sleep due to vivid dreaming, um, 
other conditions uh, like uh, periodic movements of sleep that have nothing to do with Parkinson's, restless leg syndrome. All of these are factors why someone may not have restful nighttime sleep. So that's a common enough situation, even in a middle-aged population, not to mention an older group. Uh, secondly, uh, certain medications taken close to bedtime can increase vivid de dreaming and therefore should be taken away. Uh, dopaminergic agonists are, are notorious for causing some degree of sedation. Uh, so are you on the right dose of that drug? Do you really need it? Is the side effect worth the benefits it offers? is a question to ask. And um, the other thing is uh, Parkinson's uh, and sedentary lifestyle often predisposes towards daytime drowsiness. So increased activity and forcing activity at times of the day when drowsiness occurs like after a meal, is a good idea. There's also reason to um, use medications like that drug we talked about, caffeine. Sustained release caffeine tablets uh, are very safe to take and it's probably the best way to use caffeine for a more sustained action for several hours rather than a cup of coffee here and there or tea. And modafinil, the uh, generic name of ProVigil or NuVigil is a safe drug that can be used for people with excessive drowsiness. It's a prescription drug, somewhat expensive but it is very effective and safe to take. Thank you. Can you briefly discuss the difference between MSA and PD? I can't do it briefly. They're different <laughs> disorders. MSA uh, is much more rare. It's a much more uh, daunting disorder to treat because its disabilities include uh, impaired blood pressure, impaired coordination, uh, lack of responsiveness to Parkinson's disease medications. And over time, usually within months, if not a year or two, uh, the fact that someone who was thought initially to have Parkinson's disease uh, might turn out to have MSA. There is an MSA coalition for further information on this you can find on the internet. Uh, we talked about a DAT scan earlier. Unfortunately, doing a DAT scan doesn't differentiate MSA from Parkinson's disease. So no value of doing that test, but the MRI picture of the brain is one additional tool to help distinguish these two disorders. And multiple system atrophy or MSA has a number of different presentations, some of which don't have Parkinson's features uh, involved. Fantastic, thank you. And we'll do, uh, we'll do just one more question here. Um, is it okay to take CBD oil or use medical marijuana while on your Parkinson's disease medications? Not with the intent that it's gonna help you for Parkinson's, but I obviously a lot of people do. There's tremendous hype about CBD oil, and uh, in order to not waste your money or, or you know falsely uh, assume that what the claims you've read read about it, be be skeptical. Uh, you know, don't uh, don't go overboard in that. And marijuana has its you know a uh, lot of things you can say about it. There hasn't been evidence that it helps for Parkinson's disease, and smoking it, of course, is the same risk to your lungs that the tobacco has. You don't want to put smoke down there if you don't have to. So there are other ways if, if you're uh, enticed by uh, cannabis or marijuana to um, ingest it rather than smoking. it. Thank you so much for taking so much time to answer um, all those questions. Um, we are going to go now to Ellen Schaller, who is my coworker and fellow care advisor. She's going to give us a little bit more information about some of the ways in which we can use Dr. Lewitt's advice, um, some of the things that NeuroChallenge and your care advisor can help connect you to some of the resources discussed by Dr. Lewitt um, and just give you a little bit more information. Thank you, Ellen. Sure. Thank you, Chelsea. So my name is Ellen Schaller. And as Chelsea said, I'm one of three care advisors here at NeuroChallenge Foundation for Parkinson's. Again, we are a nonprofit based organization in Sarasota, Florida. And our mission is to improve the quality of life of people with Parkinson's and their loved ones. And we do that basically in three ways, through education, through groups, and then through care advising. There are three of us who serve as care advisors. You've met Chelsea, Stacy Carlin, and then myself. And in Florida, we are in six counties. So we are each assigned to certain areas or counties in Florida. But again, like everyone else right now, we are virtual. So there are no boundaries to our care. And we are talking to people locally and those who are very far from us in Florida. And our main, main um, 
outcome is finding them resources in their local area. So what exactly is care advising? Well, first of all, the important thing to know is we do not provide any medical care or medical advice. So we are not a clinical organization. But what we do is provide resources and recommendations in your community. And I'd like to just give you an idea of some of the inquiry, inquiries that we get. Um, a lot of them have to do with exercise because it, we all know how important it is in the management of Parkinson's disease. So we have people who are calling to ask, where can I go for rock steady boxing or pedaling for Parkinson's, which are two very specific exercise group classes. And now, of course, with everything being closed, we're getting a lot of inquiries about are these gyms, are these exercise facilities open? Um, and, and again, where do I go to get them? Another big, always a big request are people calling for more information on LSVT big and loud. If you're not familiar, big and loud are two one-on-one um, um, -on -one individual therapies for usually provided outpatient or they can be provided in the home specific to the Parkinson's community. Um, BIG is provided by physical and occupational therapists and LOUD is provided by speech therapists. So people and the therapists who are providing those that care are certified. Um, so people are calling to ask where in their community has BIG and LOUD therapy. Another example, people call us for transportation services. They no longer can drive or you know, they need some help with transportation locally, um, maybe to the airport, something like that. Um, a big request lately, and everyone can well understand this, is we've gotten a lot of inquiries about personal and companion care, agencies that provide personal and companion care. And basically, we're finding the care partners or caregivers just need some help in the home or they might need a break. They might wanna be able to leave to go shop, go grocery shopping or things like that, but they need someone to stay um, with their loved one. So we have, um, we have contacts with agencies in the community that we can recommend. And then of course, we are getting a lot more requests right now for men mental health resources as well. So those are just some, um, some examples. The one thing I do wanna go back though to the exercise, um, the pedaling for Parkinson's or the rock steady boxing or just general exercising. Um, we have compiled because in the beginning of the pandemic, so many gyms and exercise facilities were closed completely. We have compiled a list of online resources for exercise um, and, and rock steady, you know, the specific rock steady boxing and the exercise that pertains specifically to Parkinson's. So those are something that I find I'm giving all the time. In fact, I, I recommend there's a um, exercise physiologist in British Columbia, Canada, and I say every time, if I had a nickel for every time I give his referral out or his name, um, I'm glad he actually has, um, has shouted out to NeuroChallenge Foundation because we have so many people attending his classes. So it's a win-win, goes both ways. So we provide individual support to help people navigate the complexities of managing Parkinson's disease. We can help people help to explain or help folks understand the various motor and non-motor symptoms of this disease and how they can impact everyday life and also how they can you know, um, cause stress in people's lives and maybe things that we can suggest to decrease that stress. So currently all of our offices are closed because of the pandemic. So we are doing all of our care advising over the phone, over Zoom, over Google Meet, we do whatever. The main thing is that we connect with people and we help them. So whatever will work for each individual is what we're all about. Our goal is to connect with our PD community and provide support in whatever way possible, either locally or via the internet 
for those outside our area. And yes, we go to the internet a lot to research um, local local recommendations and resources for some of those things that I um, that I referred to earlier for people all over the country. Another aspect of care advising is we also facilitate groups and programs. Um, support groups are a big part of what we, how we facilitate the various groups. And in this pandemic, we have, because we've, we've taken to um, doing everything over Zoom, we have designated Thursday mornings as our support time. So every single Thursday morning at 10 o'clock, we have a support group for care partners or care uh, caregivers. Um, and then at 1130 on Thursday mornings, we have a support group for people with Parkinson's. So every single Thursday morning, again, is our time at NeuroChallenge Foundation for Parkinson's for those two support groups. Again, 10 o'clock on Thursday mornings is for care partners and 1130 is for people with Parkinson's. Both of those are support groups. And then we also have other types of support groups. Monthly, we do a support group for men with Parkinson's. Another one is for women with Parkinson's. And then we also do a combined support group of both care partners and people with Parkinson's together in a support group. And all of our support groups are, again, we, we um, maintain it for the people, the specific group that we're wanting to have the support group with. We do not communicate what happens in the support group. Um, it's, it's pertinent to the group. And, um, and that's, what, that's what we're there for. And then we are facilitating also our therapeutic and our educational programs as well. Examples, some examples of our therapeutic programs, and again, these are going on right now virtually. Some of the, these examples include yoga, dance, we have ballet, we also have um, just more of a, of a regular um, type dance class. We have laughter, we have creative writing, we have a creative arts session. Um, and then we also, as far as the educational programs, we recently have done a series on mental health and also a series on complementary therapies. And the three of us are also responsible, like I said, for facilitating um, both of the therapeutic and the educational groups. So again, currently all of our programs are virtual. We are basically doing over 50 monthly groups virtually. And we're very, very lucky, privileged, and we feel very, very lucky to be able to provide all of our services at NeuroChallenge Foundation for Parkinson's free of charge to our community. And that's based because of the generosity of our donors, our virtual sponsors, and our community partners. All Thank right. you so much, Ellen, really appreciate it. Thank you all of you for joining us today for our first session of the We and PD series made possible by the sponsorship of Supernus and from the thoughts and dedication and hard work of our care partners who two of which are here today, Jackie Whitus and Kim Langenbach. Without you two, the series would not have been possible. So thank you for all of your efforts. Thank you of course to Dr. Peter Lewitt also, some of you may already know this, but the first 50 households who registered for this program and attended here today are receiving a complimentary copy of Dr. Lewitt's book. For anyone who might have been a little bit later to the game, but still wants information on Dr. Lewitt's book, feel free to contact either myself, Ellen, or Stacy, anyone at NeuroChallenge, and we can get you connected to that. I believe, Kim, if you still have a copy of that, you can hold it up but it's Parkinson's disease, guide for the newly diagnosed, understanding the disease, managing your symptoms and navigating treatment. Thank you again, all of you for joining us today. Please come next week. We've talked a little bit about exercise as a teaser, but next week, next Friday at 11 o'clock, we have Dr. Ellis, who's going to be telling us all about exercise and the importance of exercise on your PD journey. Thank you everyone and have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you. Thanks.